Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 16th CAF update. And uh, I appreciate you guys hanging around so long doing these things with me. It's been a lot of fun for me, of course. Uh, I can't tell you that, uh, you know, how fun it's been just being able to BS and talk about comic art every day, it seems like. And even more so since COVID, just because of, uh, uh, with the idea that, you know, COVID has kind of forced us into doing all these fun things like uh, having online shows and virtual things. And it's been really enjoyable for me. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about Comic Art Live before we get uh, into the whole CAF update stuff. Uh, I think most people probably know what Comic Art Live is, uh, but for those who uh, didn't get to participate in the May event or really the, uh, the, the origin of Comic Art Live, which happened in March, uh, when everybody was uh, concerned about COVID and knowing all the shows were going to get canceled, I started working on some programming for uh, for actually art reps and to do some work on their, uh, uh, to market them through CAF. And I was going to tie that into a show. And uh, hi, Tatiana. Nice to see you this evening. And uh, so Dan Potick actually came to me and he, as a, he's a collector. He suggested, why don't we do something on uh, CAF? And I did this real ad hoc uh, way of having a small show and there were about four or 500 pieces that were in it and maybe 15 dealers uh, or comic collectors participated in it, in it. We did it for a day and it actually worked really well. So, it, and it, I don't know how much sold because we weren't really able to track it. It was just something quickly put on spur of the moment, just trying to give everybody something fun to do. And it worked really good. And it was a good, uh, a qualifier for me to continue doing the programming that we did for comic art live. Uh, comic art live was our first show that was in the last weekend of May. It had almost 200 exhibitors between collectors and dealers and artists. And during the event, I believe there were probably 2,800 artworks that were shown. Uh, and it was done in a hall fashion where we had artist alley for, versus a dealer hall versus a collector's hall. And uh, you know, like I said, about 3,000 pieces were in it. I know that during the show, probably 15% of the artwork that was on display sold. Some of the greatest things that kind of happened during the, the event was that everybody's booth had links either to their own personal gallery on CAF if they were a collector, which also then linked into their classifieds where they had more artwork for sale. And uh, for dealers, it linked over to their sites. And the thing that I heard uh, by many people after the event was that there were so many ancillary sales after the fact that it just made the event even more special. And the way people were able to participate in that first event was they either needed to be a, a premium member of CAF or they needed to support CAF through advertising in some way, and then everybody just got a free booth. And it uh, it was really an exciting event because it brought in probably about 25,000 people that weekend, uh, more than we would normally have. And it brought in a lot of premium memberships for us, so it kind of helped support the effort of putting two months worth of programming into doing it. So uh, our next event is on November 14th and 15th, so not too far away, less a uh, little over two weeks. And it's gonna be on that weekend and it's gonna start uh, and open to the public, I believe at, well, I don't believe, I know at 1 p.m. to the public. Premium members are gonna get two hour early access to the show starting at 11 a.m. on that day. And everybody who's an exhibitor is going to get to have an art drop on Saturday and an art drop on Sunday, 24 pieces maximum for both days. So we're expecting much more than the 2,500 total pieces of art that we had in the, the first show. Um, I can't really speculate. It'd be great if we had 3,500 or 4,000 pieces. and. Uh, the, uh, the first, so the first drop or art drop is really exclusive to the premium members for that first two hours of uh, uh, preview time for them. And then from 1 p.m. Saturday through 6 p.m. on Sunday, the show is open to uh, anyone who wants to attend. And uh, we'll be running panels both days. Uh, I believe on Saturday, they're going to start at 2 and go till at least 7. And then on Sunday, they're going to start at noon and run until 5. And most of those will be with... Uh, probably primarily with uh, art dealers and artists. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be seeing some art selling going on in those like we saw in a few of the panels the first time around. And uh, I'm trying to encourage everybody to do that so that the panels are uh, as engaging as walking through the halls and buying artwork. Um, you know, I want everything to be a, a good marketing opportunity for everyone that's uh, uh, exhibiting there. And I wanna hope that I can build, help them build uh, their brands better and uh, for collectors just to sell work out of their collection. So um, booth setup actually started uh, yesterday and uh, there was a little snafu for people who hadn't had a booth in the first show, but we did fix that programming. And so anybody who uh, who is a premium member, they'll if they go into their gallery management page, 
where it lists out all the gallery rooms and stuff, there is a link and a box at the top that lets you go in and either create your booth or just work on your booth. So the booth is uh, manageable from now up until one hour before the show opens to uh, premium members on that Saturday, November 14th. So at uh, 10 a.m., it's cutoff time for adding art. We're still going to do the same thing we did the first one, which was the artwork gets frozen. Uh, so you can't add or remove artwork after the show starts. I mean, at the end of the day, if you go to a show, you're not like bringing new art in afterwards. We really wanted a finite number of pieces. This 48 is actually a, a test for us because I really felt that when we only limited it to 18, it was a lot of artwork to get through as a buyer. Uh, you know, especially trying to cram it into those first two hours when you're a premium member and you're trying to get in there and look at stuff before the, the rest of the crowd gets in. So uh, I'm, you know, in a, little, in a way I'm a little concerned because I think having 24 pieces from uh, say another two, you know, up to 200 uh, exhibitors is gonna cause, that you're never gonna be able to get through all that art before the rest of the crowd gets in. So, you know, it's an experiment and, uh, you know, 48 pieces rather than 18 is gonna be interesting to see how that works out. But, you know, at the end of the day, everything that everybody's doing to, online and these virtual convention experiences has been an experiment and we're all learning from it. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if it, this, if it goes well, we'll do it again. If it doesn't work great, we'll, we'll change things up for the next time. So that's, uh, you know, what we've got going on with the show uh, as far as, uh, hey, hey, Rich, nice to see you as well. As always, I appreciate it. Thought maybe you might be helping Neil this evening. Um, what we wanted to, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, kind of plow through the regular CAF update that I do every week because I've got uh, Mike Berkey sitting in the green room. Um, obviously, Mike is from uh, the regular Tuesday comic art live chats that we do. But um, last June, when we did the Bashara interview at his place, uh, I took a lot of pictures when I was there, and uh, actually the Mancuda one, the one before that. And so, because we were, and we talked about it, we thought it would be fun to kind of show off the, uh, you know, Mike's. Spidey exhibit effectively that uh, he's got at his house and that we always kind of talk about but no one's ever really seen except for those of us who've got to hang out with him. So um, with that in mind, I wanted to uh, start off like I usually do with the comic art dealer update. And uh, this past week there was a, a total of $358,000 in sales from the dealers that we work with. Uh, we've tracked that was down from 424 the week before, but the 424 was kind of an aberration because of one seller. Uh, for last week with the dealers, it wasn't like any one dealer in you know in particular you know kind of won the day. It was spread out fairly fairly well. Panel Page uh, was number one with just under ninety two thousand in sales, with Anthony coming in second uh, with sixty seven thousand in sales. And uh, then our buddy Mike Berkey at RamitaMan.com, he came in third with forty eight thousand sales, and that was followed up by let's see Comic Art Page uh, with Will. He had forty two. Uh, thousand Albert uh, had 38 and Felix had 37 so it was really really spread out very well and uh, you know just a, it was just a solid week and I from the things I'm seeing already I'm seeing another very solid week in sales for the dealers so uh, it's just you know like we've been talking about all uh, this whole year you know the sales have just continued to be strong even with so many side events going on um, if you saw my auction preview there literally is I think you know, there's two auctions that were ending this evening. There's the Comic Link auction that many of you are probably bidding in while you're listening to this. And uh, Russ Cochran had an auction earlier. So there, there's just so much activity going on out there uh, between sellers and buyers. It's uh, it's almost hard to keep track of all of it. And uh, it's been hard for me to keep up with it, to be honest, even though I'm putting all these reports together for everybody. So uh, as far as the top sales for dealers during uh, this, this uh, week, and I always forget to mention it, it's for the period October 19th through the 25th. And uh, so we start off with, uh, actually the top three pieces are from Panel Page. They are a Marvel Team of 33 cover by Gil Kane, sold for the asking price of $32,000. We're actually gonna see this later in the uh, uh, popular art on CAF because it already made its way there. Uh, this is a John Byrne Fantastic Four 246 page, classic uh, Reed Richards, Dr. Doom battle. It's sold for $18,000 as its asking price. And uh, and that was from panel page as well, as is this page, another fantastic for this one's uh, burn as well from issue 250. And uh, the asking price on this one was $16,000. Now, next up is a piece sold actually by Mike Berkey. And I can complain about the scan quality of this one, Mike, but I know it was uh, five separate 
uh, Spider-Verse covers by Matt, Mark Bagley. It's asking price uh, when it sold was 16,000 as well. Uh, this Peter Parker, uh, Bob Wyasek, uh, Spectacular Spider-Man number 59 cover. Um, this was sold by Will's Comic Art page and its asking price was also $16,000. And finally, another panel page piece. This is a GI Joe number 28 cover and it is by Mike Zek, of course. And uh, you wouldn't wanna be those guys in that tank, would you? Now, um, so again, solid week and I'm seeing real solid week already from dealers. So jumping right into the auction house results. Uh, Auction house results were up uh, 250,000 uh, this period versus 212,000 the, the week before that. Um, of course, we're only tracking eBay and Heritage for these auction sales and not other uh, venues that are out there. Hopefully one day, I mean, there's a lot of auction houses that uh, I'd like to get under our uh, reporting realm, but um, you know, maybe, maybe we'll see. But so let me hop in and get those out of the way. Um, the first set is from eBay, the first three. This is a Sam Keith Marvel Comics Presents number 104 cover, and uh, it sold for $4,500. I know the seller was trying to get rid of this quick for some, I know 50% of it was going to charity. I think they could have done better somewhere else, but, uh, you know, because you don't see Sam Keith covers too often uh, on eBay. This is a uh, J. Scott Campbell Wolverine variant cover. It sold for $3,738. Um, you know, not a bad price. Uh, for that, um, again, I think it could, could have done better. And then at, from the same seller, this was a Spider-Gwen variant cover, Spider-Gwen number 25 by Ed McGinnis. And these uh, next three pieces are pieces sold on Heritage, their top three sales. This was a Dan DiCarlo Humorama piece uh, from Joker Magazine. Actually, it was sold for $3,120. Uh, next up is this amazing Spider-Man 266 page uh, by Sal Buscema and Joe Rubenstein. It sold for $2,640. And the last piece is by someone who I was not familiar with. Uh, this is George Freeze. This is a uh, 1955 Archie's Girls page, uh, first page. This is from issue 18, sold for $2,640. Um, I don't believe George Freeze is actually in our uh, artist database either, so I've got to like, I've got to correct that. Um, so with that out of the way as well, I want to get onto the popular artwork. Uh, obviously, these are always my picks primarily, even though I kind of look at uh, the trends on CAF, you know, what people are liking and uh, viewing and commenting on. Um, but again, at the end of the day, these are the pieces that I select throughout the week as the ones that I want to feature in the uh, update. So here we go. The first piece is a Jim Lee Scott Williams uh, Batman Dark Knight. Uh, Master Race number five cover. This is in the collection of Matt E. Uh, very nice uh, uh, cover by them. I mean, I, I was uh, impressed with the price uh, when uh, it was sold by Albert Moy. Next up is a Bruce Tim Mary Marvel pinup. This is in the collection of John Hess. And this is the Marvel team up cover that we saw earlier. And it is in the collection of West Stefan. And it is, of course, by Gil Kane and Frank Giacoya. This next one is uh, very seasonally uh, appropriate. It is a Tomb of Dracula number 42 cover from 1976. Uh, nice image of Blade about to get spiked. And of course, uh, it is done by Gene Colan and Tom Palmer from the collection of Dino Mauricio. This is a really nice 2000 AD page by Brian Bolland, and it is in the collection of Yo Curry. Uh, they had a very nice story to tell with, about Joseph Melchior helping them get the piece, uh, if you get a chance to read that. Um, of course, this is Art Adams, a Dark Phoenix pinup in the collection of Jimmy Lawrence. And uh, I mean, you can't do wrong by getting anything by Art Adams uh, that's a pinup. That was beautiful. Uh, this is a uh, double page spread for, uh, in the collection of James S. And it is from The Boys. It's issue 50. It's kind of a flashback origin scene. Uh, one of the few pieces that you'd see all, so many of the characters on one page. Uh, and, and this, of course, once again, is a Bruce Tim piece. It is in the collection of Kent Mansley. It is the Spider-Gwen number one cover. And ironically, this is kind of a cl classic Spidey pose on the Spawn 301 cover by Alex Ross in the collection of Matt E. I really like this piece. You can kind of see him smirking underneath the mask. 
And uh, the, uh, another piece from your Yo Curry's collection. This is a Trad Moore Silver Surfer page. And uh, Trad, of course, is repped by Felix Comic Art. This is in the collection of Paul P, who we regularly feature their art. This is uh, by Tom Grummet and Brett Breeding. It is a Superman Man of Tomorrow number three cover from 1995. Uh, another uh, Felix uh, a rep gentleman, uh, James Heron. This is a uh, commission of Cyclops, and it is in the collection of Kent Mansley. And another fellow X-Men collector, uh, after my own heart, this is from X-Men 192 in the collection of Jason D'Ambrosia. It's John Romita Jr. and Dan Green, and Mohawk Storm is always a favorite. And finally, this is a uh, commission in the collection of Malcolm Bourne. It is by Sean Phillips, and it's from Blade Runner, of course. And he had mentioned something about it being used or was going to be used um, at the, uh, uh, I forget, as a demonstration piece somewhere. I'll have to go back and read that. Um, I didn't, uh, I don't quite remember exactly what it was for, but you know, I always like Sean Phillips work because he, typically when he's doing interior stuff, he's always, uh, he always draws himself into that. So that's one piece where he could not draw a likeness of himself into the work. Uh, and uh, sorry to see your comment, Rich, about the boss let you go early. So, Hey, I don't want to leave Mike Berkey sitting in the green room any longer. He's been in there for 18 minutes waiting patiently. So I'm going to bring him into the stream. Hey, Mike, how you doing tonight? Hey, all's well, all's well. Man, it's like you're you're wearing a piece of art or something when I see that t-shirt. Oh, it's a big old collage thing, marble collage thing. Check that out. It's, it's like, uh, it's yeah, it's, you just need some blue lines on the edges. and uh, uh, Yeah, it's, I said, they, they oddly enough, they did it all in light blue without other colors, but it's sort of cool. It is. It's nice. It's nice. <laughs> So see, I, you know, I was trying to get like spidey colors behind me, but all I got was like this blood red thing going on. Nice. I'm sorry. Red is so cool. You're wearing blue and you got red in the background. So those are spidey's two colors. There you go. All right, cool. <laughs> so, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, doing this for a while and uh, I wish I'd shot more video in June when I was over at your place. Cause I really only did, uh, where did I even shoot it? I shot, well, I shot some in the, uh, your toy room, the collectibles yeah. room. And I did shoot just like, I, I did some pieces down downstairs and whatnot. Um, so, like before we get started talking about your art and stuff, do you mind if we show some of the pictures? Yeah, because uh, believe it or not, I don't even know what pictures you took, so they'll be new yeah, to me too. So, yeah, you might hate them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm just going to start off and put the put the video out there. Uh, this is going to be a, a clip of me walking through uh, Mike's spider-man toy room and i helped him move half of this stuff if not probably all of this stuff when he moved into his uh yeah. this house i don't even know when that was but uh he he basically built a room that this there was a loft area and he encased it all in glass and that is where he put all of his spider-man collectibles and it's uh you get to see it right now yeah i did it so it with glass so you could actually see it from the lower levels as well as the upper levels so, I mean, clearly, Mike, uh, you know, there's probably not a toy or a puzzle or a sleeping bag or a Halloween costume that you don't have that has been put out there for Spider-Man, right? Pretty much have everything that I could think of, yeah. If we went back, I said, people, a lot of people don't, they always say, what's the first Spider-Man toy? And believe it or not, uh, 1963, Ben Cooper uh, put out a well, they actually put out a Ben Cooper. Everybody remembers Ben Cooper. They put out Spider Man costumes in the 50s. They actually had a Spider Man costume in 1955 and in 1957. Ah, yeah, the, the on, on the right side, that is the very first Spider Man collectible ever produced 1963. That is since they had a they had a Spider Man costume, Ben Cooper, in 55 and 57. It was just Spider Man, it was yellow and black. And I'd love to get one of them pre-Spider-Man, and whenever Spider-Man came out, since they had that, believe it or not, they had the term Spider-Man copyrighted, both same same year as Spider-Man 1 comes out, they came out with that costume on the right, right there, and it's 1963. Well, you know, when I was, because yeah, you weren't with me when I was taking the pictures, but I always remember that story, so I, I thought, you know, I bet you Mike brings this up, because I remember you were always telling me, like, this was one of the hardest things to find. Yeah as a collectible because there aren't many where that still have the box and whatnot. Right. But then the costume is even unused. 
suppose a couple of years back, a guy insisted there was only like four or five known. And I emailed him. And I said, well, there's one more. So, <laughs> yeah, this was, and uh, yeah, this was a picture, you know, for another picture from the room with the banks and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but uh, so that's, you know, that's the main collectible. So you've been collecting uh, toys probably, I'm imagining, it, even longer than you were collecting art, or, or what, do you, no, what do you think, about the same? Believe it or not, about the same time. When I got out of the Army in 89 is when I bought my first piece of art. Then that next year, is I bought a few toys uh, from uh, the, that old uh, shoot. That was that, it was that old uh, collector's magazine. It was like the toy version of uh, Comics Buyer's Guide. I can't think of the name of it. But I used to buy from them. I think they were put yeah. up on the same company. And and I would just display them at my house. I had before, I would just put them on shelves. And I go, toys are sort of cool. I think they're actually harder to find than the comics. So I thought cool toys would be neat neat things to show. And then that grew as well when I started collecting the art. So. Sure. All right. Well, here's, uh, I'm going to kind of start from downstairs with some other photos from down there. Yeah. And then uh, you can see up above, that's where the uh, the toy museum is. But this yeah. is just. This hey, is can you keep that photo there. I want people to see the Santa Claus. Did you see that top row of Santa Claus pieces? The fourth one from the left or third from the right on the top row, that's actually John Ramita drawing Santa Claus from 1949. It's white, has the green leaves. That's actually, I believe, his very first published piece of art he ever created. Uh, it was for a magazine in New York, but he drew that when he was 19 years old in 1949. Uh, that Santa Claus, that fourth from the left, just below the Spider-Man vitamin ad uh, uh, with the white background. That's that's one of John Romita's first ever published pieces of art. So I, I thought that was perfect. I'm big into Christmas stuff, so I collect Christmas-themed art uh, as well as uh, Spider-Man art. So Right. And I will say that Mike Berkey does not drink. He's never had a drink, and but well, he has one of the uh, best-stocked bars in, uh, <laughs> in all of Kent. Yeah. <laughs> When we have parties, uh, we have good parties. That is quite true. So mm -hmm. let's see. So a few other images from down in this uh, this area of the house. Mike's got a lot of statues. Yeah, those are all life size statues. And uh, here's another one. And and uh, you know, I kind of put it because it was always next to this piece. And I know when we you and I t you told me the story about this piece, I thought it was really interesting. I thought you might like to tell everybody about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The piece on the right, believe it or not, that was actually a comics buyer's guide cover. Just the goblin in the bag. The goblin holding the bag with the tree. That was a, it was called a Christmas on the Green. It was a, uh, a charity place. And it said on it, you could buy this original art uh, for charity. And uh, I contacted the guy and he says, well, for $600, it's yours. I said, okay. Now, it's hard to see from the, but, but the piece is actually like, like uh, 28 by 36 inches. It's very large. So it's funny. Uh, and people will probably say, well, why is Gwen and Mary Jane? Uh, I actually took it to John Ramita and I said, I said, I love Christmas themed art. I said, can you add Peter and Mary Jane to the drawing? And I, I thought, John, and I just, I gave it to John. And I said, I'll pick it up next year or whatever. And uh, he did the penciled heads of Mary Jane and Peter there. I actually sort of wanted them as part of the scene. So I probably didn't make it clear to John and I felt bad. I said, oh, I thought they were going to be part of the scene. And John goes, well, hang on. He goes, I'll keep it. And then he added the Spider-Man in the background, like Jason the Green Goblin, to make the scene more uh, uh, interactive. So I thought that was sort of cool. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's actually a published cover to a Comics Buyer's Guide, the Christmas 1992 issue of Comics Buyer's Guide. Yeah, this is a piece. I don't know if you have the, the picture before. Uh, I had a picture of this, and I, a friend of mine in Italy said his brother was a painter, and I had done a couple art deals with him. And he says, my brother wants to do a gift for you. And believe it or not, I said, he goes, send me scans of the two art pieces you're holding, me, you, me and John. And I sent him scans of the art, and I can't believe it. And this piece is very large. It's like 40 by 50 inches. And his brother painted it. Uh Painted me and John with the art John was holding. He did the, and that's the cover to Spider-Man 600 and, uh, and uh, an unpublished How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. And I thought it was really neat that just from the photo I sent him, his brother did this huge oil painting uh, for me as a gift. And that's in my living room. And, and I'm proud and show people. And it's an honor to show people the man whose art I collect and, 
And uh, I'm very proud of that. And I love showing that to people. Yeah, it's impressive. Like you can see it here in this, this oh, photograph, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, you can see Mike's pretty much just surrounded by art when uh, when you walk in the room. And he's got uh, a lot of uh, cover recreations by Camolo uh, hanging up in the room, I think. And yeah. uh, there's, there's some a... 3D, there's some 3D ones at the top. This guy, I don't know if people know those ones, the 3D where the characters actually pop out like two, three inches from the piece. Like that Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man uh, Annual one, you, it's hard to tell. But they're actually like, they stick out like two, three inches from the piece. They're like 3D, and uh, those are pretty cool. And uh, the John Ram people, don't, a lot of people don't know, John Romita created the Spider-Man float for the Macy's Day Parade. And second from the left on the top is the Macy's Day, 1986 Macy's Day Parade. And John signed and dedicated one of the posters to me where Spider-Man is the main image with Snoopy on the Macy's Day Parade. And, of course, I said how I like Christmas art, so I have a lot of original. Those are all original uh, Grinch cells from the cartoon, the 1966 cartoon. On that second level, I have a bunch of uh, Grinch cells. And, yes, uh, I'm a big fan of a uh, Camolo. Uh, so on the left, uh, I have I have a bunch of uh, Camolo uh, paintings uh, uh, from him as well. Uh, interesting, it's hard to tell from there, if you, the, the – the picture of me and John Ramita on the lower left, if you look just to the left of that, I just thought it was a, 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 a pretty cool. I have a, a, a original, believe it or not, I have original Charles Dickens inscribed piece. It's it's uh, to the left above that little metal, metal table on the far left of the screen. But it's a dedication from Charles Dickens, and then I have it framed around uh, four covers of A Christmas Story. So I thought it was cool to get an original Charles Dickens signature from the 1800s, you know. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, and this, this next one just shows Mike's dedication to Spidey. And uh, and I've, I've actually seen him in this before. Oh, oh that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to show that stupid costume I wore for Halloween like eight years ago. Uh, no, I was not. No, I have a picture <laughs> of you in that costume, but I was not gonna I was not gonna show that. That was that wouldn't have been a right, so I'm an oversized venom. I don't look like Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. But you had you actually had this card done up, right? Yes, yes. Uh, believe it or not, the car itself was blue. And uh I had a guy, do you have do you have all the different versions of the front and back? I think I sent you some, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's a total body wrap, and and I thought it was awesome. And and uh, the back of it is sort of cool. You, the back of it shows I have Spider-Man heads on the back of it, which is pretty cool. I don't know if you have that one I sent you, Bill. Nah, right? you know the only ones I had, I was I had like a shot of the front of the car oh, too. Okay. I, I sent you the back of it tonight. I don't know if you had gotten it, but uh, uh, I, I must have. Oh, no, that's it. okay. Sorry. But uh, the back of it, next to the license plate, it has a couple of cool headshots of Spider-Man from the back. Because a lot of people, I used to have a license plate that said Spider. And then people just go up to me and go, you like spiders? I go, no, it's for spider Man." So then I decided to get a new net license plate to make it like S-P-D-R-R-M-N. So people don't think I'm into bugs. I'm actually into Spider-Man. <laughs> so I have some spider license plate, then S Spider-Man minus the vowels license plates, you know. Well, so that's the way to do it. Yep. Now you know another uh, major image as you in the house is uh, is actually a photograph, and, I, and you you even gave me well actually I, oh, here, I'll pull I, it up yeah, yeah you gave you gave me a signed version of this that doesn't have you in it uh, but right. but That's this one, one yeah this is from 1996 Christie's auction uh, man it was that was like that was like meeting Santa Claus in person man getting to meet Stanley and John Ramita and Joe Sinnott. that was at the Christie's auction. And uh, the, the, the sad part of this piece, now I blew this up. This drawing here is, this picture here now is like 30 by 40 inches. And uh, everybody signed it, but Stan signed it in thinner Sharpie, and it all faded away. Uh, he wrote, like, with a great collection comes, comes great responsibility. Keep thy webs untangled, Stanley. And it all faded away. I was able to send it back to him, and I was hoping he would go over the line work, but he at least wrote Excelsior Stanley. But right above it, all his uh, all his marker faded away. But the great Joe Sinat, who sadly we lost not too long ago, uh, he signed it. And then, of course, John Ramita in the upper left. And John is actually holding the Spidey 40 cover in his hand that I took to get John and Stan to sign. And, of course, the back cover to the first Marvel Treasury 
Uh, I had taken that to the show, but that was it. That was in November of 1996, and that was just awesome. That was what a great time meeting meeting your heroes, you know. And people think that Spider Man in the background was like a statue. That was actually a guy in a Spidey suit, and he was really good. He was around taking pictures with everybody, but that was awesome. It's hard to believe. God, that was almost 25 years ago. Woo. Right. I mean, that was a that was a major event. I mean, as, in, the, in the history of comic art. It was. Uh, yeah, that was that was uh that was the fourth Christie's auction. So now hey, uh these might be fighting words, but Ron Lim, hey Ron, how's he, how's it going? Ron said he says, unlike Mike, most of my Spider Man collection is in my garage, but I'm pretty sure my collection rivals his. So awesome. it, you guys would have to compare collections sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh let's see, I, I think before I, I I took a bunch of pictures like in your immediate office. Um, the only other photographs I took outside of your office were just a couple pieces that I think were up in the, oh, yeah. the locker. And yeah, you the know, Spidey Fifty. And again, the piece on the right is humongous, and uh, that that was a, that was on a poster for Secret Wars Two, as I believe every single character in the Marvel Universe at the time uh, when Se when uh, Secret Wars Two came out. I think, gosh. I think that was by Tom Morgan. I'm not actually sure who the artist. I think that's a Tom Morgan drew that. Drew that. I remember. Right. I remember trying to see who had signed it, and I couldn't see it when I took the picture. So I kind of yeah. Up. I actually can't remember. But very but, very cool. Now uh, you know. Obviously, you've seen Mike in his chair many times. Uh, here's another picture of him behind. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the coming up post. Uh, yeah, so you can see how much art you don't see sit, you know around Mike. I mean, he is literally surrounded by stacks of art all the time and so i don't know how he keeps it organized because yeah what's you know, my term um i call i call my room organized clutter is what i call it so everybody goes how do you know where everything's at i go trust me i know where every piece is at but i have different stations for everything yeah <laughs> believe it or not that warner brothers wow that is summertime i'm a little red yeah that uh, was in june yeah <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, believe it or not, I got that from our buddy Matt E. That on the bottom there, uh, it, it it covers up a front. That's all original art. Funny story about that. I've got that from Matt E. Uh, 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 years ago. But uh, when Warner Brothers still had their stores, they were just on the verge of signing a contract with the WWE and doing a thing with the like like putting in all the Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny type characters with with like Hulk Hogan and Randy Macho Man Savage all the wrestling stars of the day and they were going to sell posters and prints and all that. But that was right before uh, the Warner brothers all went out of business. And this is, this is, I mean, you can see that that's, uh, that piece is like about 10 feet long uh, or, or 10 to 12 feet long. And that's all original. And that was like the, the main promo thing that was going to go below the facades of the Warner brothers stores when they were going to start selling their, uh, WWE Warner Brothers characters uh, memorabilia. Yeah, it was. It's pretty huge. I don't know if it's twelve feet, but it was. It was big. Uh, is this, do you yeah, still have it there? Really yeah, I still have it. Uh -huh. It's so big. I know. I I know. My buddy Matt goes. You ever sold it? I go. It's so big. I would only be able to sell it to somebody in the states. I could only imagine <laughs> how much that thing would cost to ship overseas. Shipping oh, yeah. would probably be more than what the piece cost. I'm sure. Right. But it's really funny. Funny thing. And then, yeah, this is just, yeah, this is just another section of Mike's office that, oh. uh, you know, and I don't even know what you, I think Mike, you always told me this is like where the heritage, you know, your heritage winnings yeah. come in before you well, process it. And as silly as it sounds, my brother comes over and helps me, believe it or not, the stuff on the left is just stuff that needs to be taped. I said, I said, I got too much art to put on the website. My brother comes over once a month and he tapes my art for me. <laughs> so that's, a, that's all art that I put on the website and my brother's going to come over and tape it for me. That's what that was. I didn't well, know you took those pictures. <laughs> and I told you I took a bunch of them. I got and you know, and then uh, he has. He, then Mike's got this huge closet, and you know, part of his organization skills. And you you don't know it, but these 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 carts are actually on wheels, so he can pull them out and, uh, okay. and right. I mean, I think it's yeah, smart yeah. the way you, the way you set everything up. <clears throat> Believe it or not, every, every shelf has it has its uh, it has its uh, own or. So, yeah. yeah, none of that stuff is on my website. So that's all stuff to be to be put on. 
Is that how you end up doing it? Because you, you, I know that, like, I, I took a picture of the tubs. Everybody knows the tubs that you bring around. Yeah, that's all, my, that's all my show. That's all my show inventory on the top and the bottom left. Yeah. Right, right. But then, so you, so everybody's seeing there is a, you know, there's always a lot more art, you know, much more art that Mike doesn't have on the site or that he's not bringing to shows only because how do you get through it all, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, you know, before, you know, we've got a bunch of scans of artwork that I think, some of it we've seen before, but a lot of it we haven't. Sure, sure. And uh, there was a question um, from somebody online said from Uncanny Two Six Six said of all the original cover art you own, my favorite is ASM Fifty Five. Oh, and he, he's curious. Yeah, you know, how did you obtain it? Oh yeah, well the fifty. Well, I bought it from Heritage. <laughs> yeah, that's what I. That's what I thought. I thought that was a Heritage a Heritage auction. Yeah. So I mean, listen, Heritage. I always tell people that, and I get it helps them, not us. But I said. You know, before Heritage, man, I used to get offered as a dealer so much art with, with Heritage and Comic Link. I said, I don't get offered as much art as I used to. So, unfortunately, if you want a great piece, sometimes you have to buy them at auction because not a lot of people offer, offer the big ticket items privately anymore like they used to. Right, right. So, I mean, that's, that's understandable. Right. Well, I mean, Heritage has helped, you know, push the market along just like the dealers have. And, you know, I, and so I, I, I can see why sellers would just rather – Put it over in heritage right i mean yeah, yeah. Just, but i mean there's still, there's still shares you know i bought i just bought a nice I'm just i'll just put in another way i just bought a really nice collection of, of 70s art from a guy i'm going to be putting on the website in a little while uh but um he went to me and he goes yeah i called other places around and he goes he goes have you ever heard of heritage and i go yeah i'm go i go i'm just curious uh why you contact me not heritage and i'll be honest he goes he goes well they told me my stuff was worth a lot, but they want me to put it in the, with no reserve. He goes, I'm not putting art in any auction with no reserve. He goes, I'd rather know what I'm going to get and do a deal privately. So I said, okay, then I'm your guy. <laughs> right. So, well, I'm just well, saying, well, auctions work great. I mean, it's it's like anything else. You might get way more than what something's worth. You might get way less. So it's it's your cause. It's just like it's taking a chance, you know? So mm -hmm. do you want to take a chance on getting a lot, but you might get less? Or do you want to just get a concrete number that makes you happy and do a deal? So. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's like those, uh, you know, like those, uh, you know, we're not going to say specific, you know, but those Miller pieces that we, uh, that I helped you get, and they weren't great Miller pieces, right. but it's like a guy like that, well, he could have, anyway. he could have taken them to Heritage and sold sure. them. Um, but instead, you know, he probably was the same way. He just wants to get a fixed price. Nobody right. knows what he's going to get. He doesn't have to deal with, uh, you know, waiting or, or, you know, or worrying right. about an auction. And, yeah, you know, I think it probably worked out really good for that guy. You get paid right then. You don't have to wait months, months, months down the line, especially people that want to get paid quickly, you know. Right, exactly. You, know, you work a deal out, boom, check is in the mail or PayPal's in the mail that day, you know, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Will, how's it going? Um, let's see. So, uh, and, yeah, you know, I, I, I'll just answer. Uh, Ron had a question or he already said, how big is your monitor? I know Mike's monitor yeah. is probably like a 50-inch. Yeah. No. yeah, it's a TV. It's a, it's a TV. That's why Mike is so small in, in the images and everybody's back because he's got his his camera sitting right up on top of that thing. So that's why he's got the he's always a little further set back than most of us when we're. Yeah, when we're I just computer. figured why. I mean, listen, do our whole lives we're on the computer. How much per day us guys that are in this hobby are on the computer? And I go, I don't want to be squinting. So now, like I said, when I'm looking at my head on the screen, it's almost the size of my head regular. <laughs> I don't want to have to squint. I said. Buy a bigger TVs are so cheap anyway. Why buy a monitor when you can use a TV? And that way you don't have to squint to see your stuff. So I figured I don't want to have to squint. So so much easier as long as you got a big enough table to put everything on. You know, right? You don't have a big huge computer table. It's not worth it. So yeah, I don't blame you. I've got uh, one of those ultra wide. Uh, it's As not a TV. Either, yeah, yeah. It's like I don't know. It's probably like forty four inches long, but it's only you know sixteen inches tall. So, but I can fit. I can have like three web browser screens open at one time. And before that, I always had two monitors on my my desk. So I, you know, this is so much more easier oh, yeah. for me. And it's curved too, so it's a lot easier on my eyes. Um, they want to know, I'm gonna measure it right now, because I'm not even sure how big it is. I'm gonna measure it right now for Ron. It's 42 inches. See, I, I was right, I just said 42. Yeah, 42 inches, I, I didn't even know how big it is. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's, let's look at uh, some pieces yeah. that are most well you know and we could go back to the first one because i you know i'd, I'd kind of yeah, put those have questions about anything ask away and i'll uh yeah happy to share anything 
Now, you kind of touched on this before when we talked about this when we yeah. did our origin stories back in in May when we did the first Comic Art Live live stream with Glenn. May and Will. was our first one. I didn't even realize that. Yeah, you know, we started doing those two weeks before the first Comic Art Live show wow. because I was I was trying to get my feet wet with trying to figure out how to run a panel and 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 we and the four of us had been talking about doing our own show and I thought all right this is how we're going to do it and we and then that's how we came up with doing the origin story show to kick things off and I know that we talked about this cuz uh I don't know if you, I think you got all of these from Scott Doonbeer? Uh uh well I got three pages from Scott. I don't believe I got the page 9. They were all in the teens, but the two on the right were my first two purchases I ever got from Scott. Yeah, funny story. I told you I I bought one page from him. Because I didn't even know what comic book art was. This is October of 1989. And uh, I, I, it was $110. And I bought it. And I said, I don't know what this art is, but let me just buy one. And I got it. And it's twice up, of course. Uh, but people always ask, when did Spider-Man art go small? The last large art Spider-Man issue is 53. And the first small art is 54 of Spider-Man. But uh, And I got the page in. And my jaw just dropped. And I said, holy moly. And uh, believe it or not, those signatures at the top, see, they're signed by John and Stan. I got those signed by John and Stan at that uh, 96 uh, Christie's auction. I, I took those with me when I had the pictures with them. But uh, when I got the page in, I said my, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe how amazing it was. And I'm looking at these words on the side. And a friend of mine who knew artwork over time uh, said, you know, that's Stan Lee writing the story, telling John Romita what to draw. And I'm thinking like, oh, my gosh. Month, month and a half goes by, and I call Scott Dumbier up. I go, do you still have the other two pages? He says, yep. I said, I'll take those two. And uh, over the course of, believe it or not, over the course of uh, uh, about 35, uh, no, about uh, after about 26, 27 years, I actually completed the book. I had pages two through 20. Then I met the guy that had the splash in New York City. And it's so funny. He said he would only do cash. And uh, I go, well, you're going to have to drive to Ohio. And uh, him and his wife and his little dog, they drove to Ohio. And we did the deal like in 2015 or so for the splash to 46. So I, I completed the book. So Now, is that the guy that, that you met at Comic Art Con? No. no, no. He, just, uh, he just was calling. He just... Was I remember, believe it or not, he had contacted me and Anthony, and and we both negotiated, and and he went with me. So, because I remember he said Anthony, Anthony, I think even told me he almost had a shot to get it. And I said, well, I go, I was trying to. But yeah, well, you but, needed uh, it. You I, needed it more than he did. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I was happy to get it and complete the book. Yeah, this is the first Scorpion. That's a pretty key. Uh, that's a pretty key book. I mean, I don't think it's it's okay to not, not share, but I actually uh, got this from the great Mark Evanier, and I got the whole story from him uh, back in 2013. And uh, I think Spider-Man, I tell people, if you go through every single Ditko Spider-Man book, there's more battle pages in spider other than the annuals, of course, but of the regular 20 issues, I think there's more battle pages in Spider-Man 20 than any other issue. Then again, the more I think about it, 33 has a lot of battle pages, but Spider-Man's battling Master Planner guys, he's not battling an actual villain, villain that we know. Right. And I just thought with it being, because believe it or not, Spider-Man and Scorpion actually battle like three separate times in this story. And he even got the origin of him, of course, at the beginning. And it's sort of cool, because I believe now, uh, uh, God, I can't even think of his name. He's the new Venom now. Uh, Scorpion is the new Venom. Matt Gargan. He's, I, I, believe, I believe he's the new Venom now in the comics, well, the original Scorpion. So that's sort of cool to people that are into the new stuff. I have not read any Spider-Man probably for five years. I haven't, so, read, I haven't read it either. I was told from people I have not read it. But, but Matt Gargan is actually – and I think even in the uh, – uh, the, did they call him Matt Gargan? I think in the, uh, in the uh, Vulture movie uh, – uh, one of the characters, I think they called him Matt Gargan in, in the in the movie. Not, but, uh, I'm not yeah, sure. I'm not sure, but but what a great what a great story and a great splash. So I'm very blessed to have that. Yeah, and I, I don't think I've seen it. To be honest, I've I've, I've seen a, a lot of your collection, but this is not one of the pieces that I've seen. Yeah, and I love that. Uh, 
I don't know if you ever saw they had that they had a TV TV show documentary with with uh, Lee Schreiber, and they they go through the history of comics and uh, when they come up, when he talks about Spider Man, they show the bottom panel. This is the last page of Spider Man Thirty, the bottom scene where Spider Man is pushing Peter Parker and Mary J and and uh, Betty Brant away. It's funny that this actually leads into Spider Man pushes this technically where they break up for the final time because think about it, he meets Gwen Stacy the very next issue. That is true. He first appears in Spider-Man 31. So the last breakup of Betty Brant and Peter Parker, then the coming of Gwen Stacy, the next issue. So I thought well, that's a pretty cool Spectre image of, of Spidey there. I agree. You know, I was going to use that as the blown up image on the right, but it didn't fit very well. So. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. But but since we're, uh, you know, talking. Uh, yeah. No, about no, Mary Jane, no, right, I, possessions. Yeah. John, John's uh, very, very, very first drawing of Mary Jane. And, you know, you would almost think the first drawing of something would be like a pencil doodle or something. I mean, look at that drawing. And that's the very first drawing. And to me, that's nicer than any published comic book drawing of her. And yet it's the very first drawing. Isn't that something? Yeah. And yeah. Up the hand color and give her the green green eye. eye, eye uh, uh, eyeshadow. Eye eyeshadows. I couldn't think of the eyeshadow. But yeah, I said, what what a drawing for a first drawing of a character, you know? Just amazing, uh, just amazing. Yeah, that's uh, you know, I think it's funny because uh, yeah, when I, you had mentioned in the uh, comic art live on Tuesday that you know Stan was giving uh, John Romita all you know stacks of fashion magazines and yes. things, and, and I thought you know as soon as I saw this image, that's the first thing I thought of was you know the, yeah that was probably very stylish in this you know in the in the mid to late sixties some right. kind of crop, crop top with a goofy uh, geometric pattern on it. Right, and of course, as if people don't know, you know John John Ramita uh, patterned her after Anne Margaret, who was the who was the her and you know Raquel Walsh were probably the biggest sex symbols and Sophia Loren of the day. But he said he patterned uh, Mary Jane uh, after Ann Margaret. I can see yeah. it. So that's sort of a, and she was a redhead too. So that's right. That is very true. Yeah. So I put these two together just yeah, for that, obvious reasons, but and that is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, the John's first ever Amazing Spider-Man page, the Splash the Spidey thirty nine, and uh, yeah, funny. I bought that at the. Uh, Right when I finally got a job at a hospital and finally started having money, I uh, I bought that at the uh, – uh, I take it back. I keep thinking that was in the second uh, Sotheby's auction. I did not buy it. My buddy Will got it, and I traded him for that, the Splash the Spidey. Uh, funny, they put that in the auction without even a picture. They added it afterwards. They oh, really? The catalog, and they added it afterwards. It went for $5,000, and they had a 15% buyer's premium, so it went for $57.50. I believe back in 93 in the third Sotheby's, I believe on the right side. Then the left side, it, uh, this was actually to be the, the spectacular Spider-Man two cover. You can even see the 35 set in November. Yep. And uh, people want to know a funny story is this was to be the cover, but then they realized the sales were so bad on the spectacular Spider-Man number one. Stan came to John and says, we got to do everything in color. Cause if you remember the first spectacular Spider-Man magazine, the interior is black and white. But the cover, the cover is a painting based off of black and white. And uh, the sales were so bad because, you know, think about this. This was the 12 cent area comics. The, you want people to pay three times more, even though you're getting 68 pages. The sale, And plus, with it being a magazine, a, a comic book store, people couldn't get the magazine. So it had really low sales. So uh, Stanley told John he had to make it a painting after he had already created this for the cover. And so... They actually use this in all, like in Spider-Man 67, this exact image is published as a whole page ad, this actual image promoting the spectacular Spider-Man. Then he, of course, did a, did a big painting for the published cover, and they made the number two all color, uh, the magazine also. So uh, that's the unpublished cover, but that exact image is used for the painting uh, that they created afterwards. So. so pretty cool. I always tell people, if you ever want a Green Goblin Spidey cover, I always say, think about it. 39 has a great goblin and only Peter Parker. And then the 40 cover has a great Spidey image, and the goblin sort of has his head down. You don't even get to see it. So I said, for a twice up, I said, that's really the only cover where you actually see Spider Man and Green Goblin full go from the front together on, on, a, on, a, on a cover image. 
Yeah, that's funny. You know, that's something we've talked about a lot in the comic art live chats is uh, just the post, you know, posturing and posing of characters and yeah. how, how important it is to to not have their backs to you and and well, you know. That's why I was saying. I said, look how brilliant. Just look at the piece to the left. Think about it. You know, how do you get a battle scene and yet get the frontal image of both characters? And Ramita does that perfectly there. You know, because exactly. You, Usually you have to almost have, if they're not side-by-side -side battling, you have to have the back of somebody or in front of something in a two-dimensional world of comic art. But and yet, the way that is portrayed, you get the battle scene and you still get frontal images of both characters, which is hard to do. I mean, we just, you know, as a comic reader, we just think, well, okay, he just did that. But no, it actually takes a lot of thought to figure that out, you know? Exactly. No, I mean, and right, and you know, I remember when we talked about this a lot was looking at those Hulk covers of yours. Um, oh, right. You know, a couple months back, just because there were a lot of covers where, uh, you know, we looked at it and said, "Wow, it's not as impactful when you when the Hulk's not, you know, when he's facing the other direction." Right. But right, it's the frontal because a lot of times when he's battling a bad guy, think about it, you got to show the bad guy. So sometimes, sometimes, yeah, you have to have the back of the Hulk to show. Yes, a, a big a, 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 a collector owns the number two. Uh-huh. But so I wasn't that, sure. That I figured you, I knew you would know. Yep, yep, yep. Somebody we all know well owns the number two. Uh, but I he wants to keep it private, so I'm not gonna say. Yeah, this is uh our buddy Glenn Brunswick, funny story, I'll tell you. Uh I only show this one pages ten, but pages uh nine and ten. I said, get a load of those outfits that that uh that uh, Gwen is wearing on the bottom of page 10 and then, then Mary Jane on the left. But 9 and 10 is a two-page sequence. It's the first double date where Pete's dating Mary Jane and Harry is dating uh, uh, Gwen Stacy. And uh, I sold both of them to Glenn years ago, Glenn Brunswick, and, and I really regretted it. And he needed a big purchase, and he offered them back to me for just a little bit more than what he paid for them. And he goes, you want to buy them back? I go, yes, yes, yes. And I, I actually think Spider-Man 47, page 10 here, and then also page 9, where uh, Harry and Gwen are in the car, and they pick up Peter and Mary Jane for their date at the Coffee Bean. And this is also where Flash is getting ready to go to Vietnam. This is like his party uh, before he leaves for Vietnam. And uh, I, I think these are very historic pieces and just absolutely, the to me, the greatest images of Gwen and Mary Jane together is 9 and 10. And I know I've had a lot of people ask me about them. But... Uh, but they're really cool. Like I tell people, Spider-Man was the greatest soap opera ever in comics. And and honest to gosh, I actually get asked for Gwen and Mary Jane pages as much as Spider-Man pages. And I said, is there any comic book ever where people seek the character pages as much as the the battling superhero pages? And I said, it just goes to, it's a testament of how great, I always tell people how great Stan Lee and Steve Ditko were together, and Stanley, John Romita, Stanley, Gil Kane. You know, the stories were so great that even John Romita would say how he'd be drawing a book, and John Jr., John Romita Jr., would come up to him as a kid and say, Dad, can't Spider-Man ever, like, catch a break and have a good ending at the end of the story? And even John Sr. says to me, he goes, I realized people actually care about these characters like they're real people. He goes, that made him feel good. He goes, people care about these characters so much that they want them to have a, they want them to not always have a sad time and have a good time. And, 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 uh, and, uh, I just thought that was really great. And, uh, that's why I was saying, uh, Spider-Man, the first hundred, 125 issues of Spider-Man, I always tell people is the greatest soap opera ever in comics because there was, yeah. so, there was as much drama outside of the battling. And I don't think that, that in that time period was with any other comic book. No, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces. I actually got this from our friend Tom Horvitz many, many years ago, probably about 20 years ago. I said, that's just, his pants almost look like there's white on it, but I, I took that with a flash, which I shouldn't have, and uh, so that the blacks got faded out. But that's one of the classic pages. Inter it's funny, they say Spider-Man 86 at the top, but it's actually Spider-Man 87, where Peter thinks he lost his powers, and he gives up being Spider-Man, and he comes in and tells everybody he's Spider-Man, and... Uh, but that's one of the most classic, one of the few times for me to ever drew an interior splash. I think, I think, believe it or not, after the 
after the garbage classic garbage can splash, the Spider-Man No More from Spider-Man 50, I think that's the very next full interior splash page you ever did. Hmm. And I, mean, I could be wrong, but I think that's the, the, the next one. And after that, it's issue 94, where Spider-Man is surrounded by all the villains from the origin sequence. Yep. Those are the only interior splashes he ever did in the first uh, uh, 100 issues. Bermuda himself. Right, right. The classic, 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 yeah. No, this will, this is what I want to, you know, I, I didn't take all the images that he sent, but this one was one of my favorites too. Yeah. And then this one, I, you know, when I saw this, I'm like, I, you know, my jaw dropped. I, was, I, I actually re remembered seeing this, you know, before. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed. I, I love this piece. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I get asked a lot about that. Yeah, the, the classic eight arm Spider Man, you know, and people always say one on one, you know, they did a lot of the thing about it. That was actually a two, that was a two issue origin of, uh, you know, Morbius and, you know, Spider Man trying to come up with a solution to help Morbius, help the lizard and himself. And instead of helping, you know, Morbius wants his serum to, to, to uh, become more powerful. The lizard wants a serum to get rid of being the lizard. And Spider Man, Gets it accidentally and gets those extra limbs. So right, exactly. That was a very cool storyline. It was. It was. I mean, it's one of to me. You know, somebody had asked earlier. You know, what's your favorite Spider-Man storyline? And honestly, you know, this is probably mine. <laughs> so yeah. as goofy as it is, I don't know why. I've you know, I've always. Oh no, it was it. very corny, but you know, it is comics and it worked. You know. Yeah. Exactly. But people always ask me. Yeah. Now this. Uh, I know it's trimmed a little bit. Honestly, I always tell people, to me, this is one of the greatest single John Romita Jr. piece of art. This is the double spread splash from Spider-Man 500. Believe it or not, I believe every single major villain Spider-Man fought all the way up through Venom is on this splash. Double splash. It's funny, after I got it in, I wish it's trimmed a little bit. You can't get the whole image, Bill, or no? Oh, I, I can. I, you know, the only reason I didn't was because it was just it was yeah, so okay. big. I, I wanted to show the detail. I mean, I, I could put it up there. No, I was just uh, going to show because you see there's Venom in the upper left. It's a funny story. Ramita Jr. figured it out too late. There's Carnage, but you only see the top half of his head and the bottom, at the very bottom, just below the shocker. Uh -huh. But uh, he, Ramita Jr. realized too late. He gave Venom Carnage's teeth and he gave Carnage Venom's long tongue. He realized it too late that he switched their mouths. He gave them the wrong mouth. <laughs> Because if you scroll down, the, the 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 carnage has a big, long, like twelve inch tongue, and he realized I, I switched the mouths on carnage and venom by accident. He said, which is sort of a neat little little tidbit. But but believe it or not, just about every villain, every major villain Spidey fought from the first three hundred and fifty, three hundred sixty one issues of Spider Man, I believe, are in this. The main ones again, not not a lot of the, like. I don't think we'll see Kangaroo or Man Mountain Marco, but I mean like. <laughs> But, I mean, all the main guys are, are there. I mean, even got Juggernaut. But, you know, they actually – I didn't realize they actually made this into a uh, – this was sold as a poster, too. Uh, if you look online, there's a poster of this image, too. But it's the, the – it, I always said if, if if people haven't read Amazing Spider-Man 500, you know, there's that read comic online. But yeah. read Spider-Man 500. It is a great, great, great story. Uh, uh, J. Scott Campbell did the cover. Uh, Ramita Jr. and Scott Hanna did the first 35 pages, and the last I won't I won't spoil it for anybody, but the last five pages to the book are drawn by John Ramita Sr. And I'm just saying, if you're a hardcore Spider fan, it almost will bring a tear to your eye. The last reading the last five pages to the book, but it, but it, but but the generalization, it's a story where the Earth is dying. I mean, going to get killed by Mordo, and Spider-Man has to go back in time. Doctor Strange sends Spider-Man back in time just before the Earth blows up. And Spider-Man has to relive a lot of his old battles. But there's special stuff that happens at the end. But it's just a great, 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 great story, uh, Spider-Man 500. I think uh, Anchor Jetly actually just posted. Uh, the, I have the whole book minus the page one splash. I sold it to a guy way back when. But I have the whole book minus the page one splash. And Anchor Jetly just posted in his cap gallery this week, I think, the page oh. one splash. So I, I did but miss it's that. A double book. It's a double book, too. It's like 38 pages or something. But it's an awesome, awesome story. If you're a fan of Steve Ditko, John Romita, Gil Kane, Spidey, I mean, there's a lot of flashbacks to that early stuff in this book, and it's just awesome. So I'd recommend people to go to read it online or, or buy the comic. I'm sure Romita Jr. enjoyed doing uh, you know, a story oh, like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. 
Definitely, definitely. It's awesome. It's an awesome book. Because four ninety eight, ninety nine, and five hundred like a three part storyline. To get the whole gist of it, you probably want to read four ninety eight, four ninety nine, and five hundred. But uh, five hundred is the culmination of the whole story. So, yeah, this is actually uh, um, Black Cat's second appearance. I don't think she's on the splash of one ninety four, which is her first appearance. This will be her first splash page, and it, it continues, of course, the storyline of her first appearance at one ninety four. Mm -hmm. Very cool. By who? Yeah, it was Keith Pollard. I couldn't remember. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was Pollard. Yep, Pollard Mooney. And people were asking. This is actually my all-time favorite story ever. Um, uh, who else? William. William asked, but uh, the kid who collects Spider-Man is my all-time favorite story ever in comics. Roger Stern wrote it. Ron Friends, believe it or not, Ron Friends' very first. Well, he did Spider-Man as a cameo, and I think K's are like twenty-six. But Ron Friends did the backup story in Spidey 248, and then starting with Spidey 251, he takes over Spider-Man Archers. But uh, he, he even purposely, you know, he made the whole story like it was a Steve Ditko story. And it is just so awesome. And, you know, if you haven't read it, I recommend it. I mean, I was, I was 18, 19 when it came out. It actually brought a tear to my eye when I read this story. And uh, it's just one of the greatest stories ever in Marvel Comics. And whenever they do Marvel's greatest stories, they always have this story in there, so. I agree. No, this is a, it is a classic story. And it, and I think it's always ranked as like one of his top 10 stories. Oh, it is. It's, it's great. It has everything in it. And you don't expect what happens at the end, of course. Right, right. Exactly. Hey, I, you know, I, I'm going to throw this uh, Grant Cruz question up because it was asked mm -hmm. on Tuesday and. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, we didn't see it at the time. So you want to answer this? Well, I am not, but I have a friend who buys from him directly, and I buy it directly from him. So, like, I, a friend of mine, I don't know if it was you, Grant, or somebody else. Somebody said, because I've been putting a lot of stuff up, I just had a whole bunch of X Men stuff up. And somebody asked, Can you get some Spider Man stuff or some Spider Man villains? And he's worked, uh, Mass Affair is actually working on those. And so, uh, through my middleman friend, I'm trying to get some Spider Man pinups. But if you want to email me privately, uh, if you have like a favorite or something, I could probably see if I can get something done for you through my middleman. But I don't know Mass Affair personally myself. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I saw that after the show. And yeah, yeah, I yeah. I saw it, but we were talking and I forgot. Yeah, I think he's great too. I don't even know if he draws a regular comic, but I know his paintings are amazing. Yeah, no, his his colors, I mean, yeah, he's one I hell of a... Yeah. I, I agree. He draws beautiful. I have on the website a couple of rogue and things a couple of pieces believe it or not i sold a lot of stuff privately that didn't even make it onto my website because one guy that bought one said i showed him stuff before i put it on the site and he bought up a whole bunch more so i sold like five six pieces not on the website uh of the whole x-men team separately in pinups so yeah now these, yeah, are, these, are, these are good <laughs> spider-man 200 is one of my all-time favorite funny story if you look at the one on the right i met jim mooney uh at the uh, 1997 MegaCon in Florida. And uh, Keith Pollard and Jim Mooney were there. And I was so excited. And I asked Jim to sign it before I could realize it. He signed it inside the art. But you see, he says, <laughs> to Mike, Spider-Man's best friend, Moon E. But he signed it. I wanted it signed outside the art. And before I knew it, he had already signed it inside the art. So I didn't want to. Yeah, I guess he looked for the most area. I said, oh. I didn't really want my art signed inside the art, but oh well. But I, love it. <laughs> I tell people, and I mean this sincerely, to me, Keith Pollard in the mid 70s, to me, Keith Pollard is one of the most underrated artists of the 70s. And, and I think his stuff, like his FF stuff, is still fairly reasonable. Spidey stuff, and that probably goes for more because it's Spidey, but I think Keith Pollard was one of the great Spidey artists of the 70s, and I loved his Spider Man. And, I don't think he gets enough accolades for how good of an artist he was on Spidey and Thor. He did Thor. a little yeah, bit of Thor. Iron Man. I thought his Thor was phenomenal. His and Thor he did a lot was of other things. Yeah. No, I mean cuz I was his FF his FF was phenomenal too. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. He, to me he is one of the probably most underrated artists of that I period. Mean, I think he should be held as, as high esteem as any of any of the greats of his time. Uh, yeah. I just look, I mean, look at those are just solid. I mean, great, great, great images. And again, Jim Mooney inking him. Jim Mooney's inks are so, 
Jim Mooney's blacks and shading and everything is just so great. Jim Mooney, again, I think Jim Mooney finally is getting a little bit more credit. Jim Mooney was never considered, I don't think, that great until people started collecting artwork that he inked. And I think Jim Mooney deserves uh, uh, more accolades for, the for I think he was one of the greatest inkers uh, for Marvel in the 60s and 70s. Right up there with Senna, for sure. Yeah. But Spidey 200, too, if people haven't read that, Spidey 200 is just a great, great issue. Just just a recap. In 199, Mysterio injects Spider-Man. He loses all his superpowers. And then uh, the crook that killed Uncle Ben comes back thinking Aunt May has other treasures. And Spider-Man has to battle him without superpowers. And Spidey 200 is just a great, great story, man. I mean, if you just read... Just read the word. Bill, I ask you to please just read for everybody the words on the on the on the page to the right. Which which words are we talking about? You're talking the oh, uh, Spider Man's words. Go ahead, read it. Man, I can barely see it on my screen. It's too small. Oh, okay. My screen's huge. I blame myself ever since you killed Ben Parker. I could have stopped you cold when I first saw you. Since that day, I've been haunted by the memory of my failure. Since that day, I've been striving to make up for my mistake. Well, Mister. Maybe this is my second chance. Maybe this is the day I atone for all of Spider-Man's sins. And then crunk. Yeah, that's classic. That but I mean, that is just awesome. You know, people, I think, uh, I don't know if Stanley. No, okay, it, it is Marvel. I know Stan only wrote the first 100 issues. I didn't know if he came back for that one. But, but yeah, it's just the, the wording in it is just awesome. It's just awesome. Yeah, and I, I remember the you know the cover to this issue just got you you know you you had to buy it you wanted to know oh it. yeah you know is this where where Spidey's going to finally you know uh, you know take care of the burglar and you know it, I don't know I just remember seeing that and I I think I even bought two copies of it because back then I was starting to think hey I gotta you know I gotta beef up my collection and maybe buy a couple yeah. issues when they're when they're two hundred and that sort of thing yeah. and, hey and, and read what Rich Cirillo yep there you go Rich Cirillo just posted I mean. I mean, listen, if you don't think Keith Pollard is something, if Marvel didn't think this guy was special, would he have really drawn Spidey 200, FF 200, and Thor 300? I mean, I'm just saying, Keith Pollard to me is is one of the best of that time, really. Yep. So. Yeah, without question. Uh-huh. Well, we're, we're giving him his due here. Yeah, no, and he, he deserves it. And I'm not saying it just because I collect his Spider-Man. I'm just saying even... The Thor, I have none of his Thor. I think it's phenomenal. I have none of it. I have one or two pages of his FF, but to me, you just look at him, and artistically, you just, when you look at the, I don't know if it shows so much on the comics, but when you see the art, it is just awesome. Yeah. No, and I usually, mean, Mooney was his inker on those, too. I think Mooney even inked him, I think, on the FF. I think, but maybe I'm not sure, but they're, they're, art, the inking on, on those is great as well. So. Right. Well, I know, uh, I think Glenn or Will or Glenn and Will both recently sold. Yeah, like, yeah. I, Title pages to Thor, and no. those things were beautiful. No, I, I said, I regret it now, but who knew? But like 10, 10, 15 years ago, because Keith Polar was from the Detroit area, mm -hmm. and I met a guy, I still remember we met halfway on the turnpike between Detroit and Cleveland, and I bought like 10 Thor covers from him and like 10 splashes. And I sold them all for like, you know, two grand. That's what they were worth at the time. And Will got a whole bunch of them. Will got some for me back then and, and this and that. But uh, I mean, and they were all Thor, all Thor covers and splashes, and and uh, they were all by Polar, and they were awesome. The guy goes, "Yeah, I bought them all from from Keith for like thirty bucks a piece at Detroit shows in the early '80s." And I go, "Yeah, you know, that's what they went for." You know? Yeah. Little but, did we know. I said everybody has those stories. You know, mm -hmm. I always tell people, and I know I've mentioned it in the past. I always said, you know, when I started collecting, I still remember back in 1995. I said a friend of mine said. We were looking at some of my Spider-Man pages. A guy was offering me pages in 93 for pages from Spider-Man 50 for $500. My buddy's saying, don't buy them because it was Spider-Man's origin. He goes, don't buy them. There's no Spider-Man battling. Don't buy them. It was a big draft of the splash where the guy <laughs> sells the copy yeah. to Jameson. And the one page has the first panel appearance of the Kingpin. Uh -huh. so it was a battle. And they were 500 apiece. My buddy goes, don't buy them. He's hosing you. And my buddy Bruce, I go, Bruce? One day we're going to laugh that I paid 500 for these, you know. Mm -hmm. But in 95, I said, if these Spider-Man pages are ever worth $1,000 a piece one day, I said, I'm set for life. <laughs> Twice up pages, I'm talking, you know. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know what you're talking but, about. Like I said, little did, we, little did we we dream. But I also tell people, people think I'm smart as can be. 
I tell people, I got rid of all my, I used to own, I calculated, I went through once, I owned over 100 John Romita Spider-Man covers. I got rid of every single one. Back in 97, 98, they hit like five grand. I said, Nobody, nobody's going to be able to pay over $5,000 for a John Romita pre-100 cover. Mm -hmm. I said, 5000 is the limit. I go, people will pay 1000 for a page, but they're not going to pay five grand for a cover. So I got rid of all my covers, and I traded them and used the money to buy interiors now. Right, I'm, right. I'm a splash guy. I always felt you got more bang for your buck with a splash than a cover. So I would always, I said, for the price of a cover, I could get a whole story. I said, and I still believe that, by the way. So I said, no, I'll take a whole story over a cover any day, you know. Yeah, you, you just went from the smartest guy in the hobby to somewhere in the middle, Mike. Yeah, exactly. I'm a middle, <laughs> middle. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. I, I could have had a lot of covers, but you know what? I wouldn't have the interiors. And I just, I'm a story guy, so I love pages, you know. I mean, I wish I had covers, but the covers are great. But if I could, again, swap a, if I could swap a cover for like even six good pages of anything, I'll do it, you know. Mm -hmm. I just think story pages are 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 just so cool especially if you have a bunch in a row you know right oh yeah that, that was my thinking anyway but the right. exit strategy i just thought eh nobody will buy the no there will only be five guys in the country that'll buy a cover but everybody will buy a page i figured so that was my rationale back in the day right well i mean even now you'd say you know whatever that you'd say the going price and is, that is true. Be... a great cover is 200 grand so right. we'll pay 10, 20 grand for a page. I don't know if, how many guys can pay 200 grand for a great cover now, you know? Well, the, so yeah. the analogy is probably still the same. It is completely the same. That's, that's, yeah. it's, it's just, it, the scale has moved up. The same, yeah. The, yeah. the pool that can afford 80%. 200. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way you were right. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. and like you said, you, you took each cover and you turned it into a complete issue. So it's not like you yeah. really scaled down. No, I you did. Just, right. You just kind of. And plus, like I always tell you, like like Glenn Brunswick, I remember trading him. Like people go, "Why did you do it?" I, like I remember I traded Glenn the Spidey sixty eight cover crisis on campus. Yeah. That was one of my favorite covers. I go, "Why did I do it?" But I do look through my notes, and like I got the Spidey fifty splash, and I think the Spidey sixty splash he gave me for that. And I go, ah, "I'd probably still rather have the the fifty splash the sixty splash over the cover." So I go, "It's right. okay." Yeah, you know. I traded small covers for a lot. I always told people, people always also, I'd say, well, Ramita drew over 100 covers, mm -hmm. and he only did 16 large art splashes. So to me, the large art splashes to me mean everything. That's why, you know, of course, I said, I was showing people the other night, you know, I got the uh, 40, this was in Heritage, you know, I got that. And uh, here, wait, let me angle it just right. And it's so beautiful. To me, this was always, as a kid, this was always my favorite splash. My favorite Spidey Splash. And the, with Ramita drawing his first villain ever, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and I had to pay a ton in Heritage to get it. But I, I wanted to, I wanted it really bad, so I finally got it. So, so that was really fun. Yeah. I always tell people, funny story about 41, if people weren't watching our comic art lives. You see who, you see who, who they list as the inker there, Bill? Can you read that? Uh, oh, M. Demio. Mickey Demio, right? Yeah, Mickey Demio. Okay, now look. I've always said how 41 looks different than everything else. Look what the original art has for the inker. Dick ears. <laughs> and uh, I always said the, a, lot of, a lot of pages, not the splash so much, but a lot of pages in the book, Spidey's his webs and the face are just a little funky and they're off and things like that. And I... I now I don't know. I'm going to ask John. I hope John will remember if uh, Dick Ears actually because uh, 39 and 40 are phenomenal, and 41 is still great. But just a lot of the webbing and the faces and what in the battles, a lot of battle pages, like the webbing just doesn't match and things. And that would make sense if it was the only issue of Dick Ears ever drew. So I don't know if it is Ink by Ears instead of uh, Esposito, even though Esposito's credit in the comics, but the actual art has Dick Ears on it. Now it could have been. Maybe they did the splash first. Dick Ears was supposed to ink it, and then they switched over to Esposito. I don't know. Right, but, but I just thought that was an interesting bit of history, and I think John would be the only one to know. And I, I gotta, I'm gonna have to show it to him and ask him next time I could see him. Once COVID ends, let's hope it ends soon so I can go visit him. Because you know, John, I tell people the great John Romita, one of the nicest men in the whole world. You know, he's 90 years old, and I understand. And he says we don't want to see any people. During COVID, and I go, I I totally get you there. So I'm hoping it'll end, and 
maybe I could visit him again and show it to him and see if he has any memories of uh, of that story and could tell me more about it. So, so you, you're still talking with him, though, of course. I mean, uh, just in emails and a phone yeah. call here and there. Just say hello, how you doing? How, nice. how you doing well? And he's doing okay. Yeah, so far so good. I'm very, very thankful and happy for that. Yeah, without question. Yeah. Well, I, I think I've only got a few other pieces here that you sent me. So why don't yeah. I? Uh, let's see. I'll pull up the next one here. Oh yeah, I thought that was cool. This is cool just because uh, it's one of the few pieces that again is a collaboration of father and son, mm -hmm. John Romita Jr. Again, it looks so much better. The flash drowned out the blacks on it, but John Romita pencils. Uh, John Romita Jr. pencils and John Romita Sr. inks just look so good from the first run. <coughs> they only worked together, I think, on three issues. So the 238, the 247, and I believe uh, an, uh, Annual 16. Mike, you have a memory to rival anyone that I know. Uh, just with Spidey stuff. I don't know a whole lot of other stuff, but Spidey stuff I'm pretty good at. Yeah, I always like, I don't show it a lot, but to me, you know, I paid a lot at auction. There's the 55 somebody was asking about. Yeah, That's right, yeah. But uh, the Iron Man Subby 1 cover, man, to me, that came up for auction. The reason I just said I have to buy this because uh, I just felt, you know, people don't under know the history of this piece. This is actually the one shot that started all the renumbering of the whole Marvel Universe. I mean, think about it. Uh, Hulk, Thor. Captain Marvel, Submariner, Captain America, uh, 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 Submariner, Iron Man, everybody. But this was the one shot that came out before everything. Right. And the reason, is, and again, this Gene Cola, but the thing to me was this ink by Bill Everett, who was the creator of the Submariner. Yep. And to me, the creator of the Submariner having inked this, to me, just, to me, that made this like twice as amazing if anybody else had inked it. If anybody else but Bill Everett had inked it, it wouldn't have interested me even in the least. And I just thought with Bill Everett inking it, it's just one of the most iconic covers out there to me. So yeah. no, no, it's always been one of my favorites from, from that period as well. And, and I've never been a big, uh, you know, Colin fan, but uh, you know, like the cover to Iron Man one and, uh, right, you, you know, yeah, it's yeah. An Iron Man one to me are the two most iconic covers. I, yeah. Without I, question. But but yeah, the, the Spidey cover though. That's you know, uh, yeah, I've seen that. Uh, well, I, I got to sit, hold it back in New York. Um, yeah. But yeah, well, it's a it's a and, fantastic image. And what is interesting now, just so you know, the the, the glasses, the areas where Spider Man is tangling, that is stat. But underneath them, there's full blue pencils of both images underneath uh, the stat, which you can lift up and see. And it lifts up. I should have said, yeah, it lifts up. You can see the whole. Uh, uh, Doc Ock's head goes all the way to the top of the cover underneath the, the, the dress, which is sort of interesting on that as well. You see all the way to the top of his head. Uh, I should have sent you another scan. It'd be funny to see that. No, I remember the, I remember the stats, though, but I remember, too, that, you know, like you said, you could lift them up and see the, see the yard underneath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just adds a little. And it's twice up, so it does look really big. Just presents real well. I remember the comic book, you know, reading that as a kid – you know, you say you want something eye-catching to make you want to read the book. That is just something makes you go, ooh, I got to see what happens inside of this comic book, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that, I, was, that was a doozy, yeah. Now, this uh, this last piece, I you know, wasn't quite, you know. I, oh, I, mean, I was going to show you. Now, can, the piece to the left, can you just make that bigger itself? Okay. No, no, no. That's okay. There's there's a guy in the Philippines. He, he does for Marvel. His name is Jimbo. Sa this piece is actually like over six feet tall. You know, I said, my buddy, Mike, I don't know if people remember Mike, our good buddy, Mike Lovitz, who we might have on our on our uh, comic art live show. Uh, he had Art Adams do this FF100 cover. Do you remember that, Bill? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That thing is amazing. Yeah. He did it so big with all this extra happening all around it. I used that template for this. If you look at it, if you're just looking at it now, you're saying, oh, yeah, it's like Spider-Man 100. But if you look at it closer... Uh, to the image on the right, the upper left is actually the uh, Spider-Man Annual 3 cover. The upper center is actually the Spider-Man 66 cover with Spidey Mysterio. Yep. The far right is Spider-Man 122 cover uh, with Spider-Man and Goblin. And if you go down from there, uh, far right now below that is the Spidey 43 cover with Spidey on the with holding on to the horn of the rhino. 
Yeah. If you go just below that, we have the Spidey 53 cover. If you look at the big piece now, two-thirds of the way down below Doc Doom's head, there's a Spidey 53 cover with Spidey Battle and Doc Ock. Then below that, bottom right, is Kingpin Swing and Spider-Man. There's a Spider-Man 60 cover. Bottom center is, is uh, Spider-Man 46 with Spidey and the Shocker. Then the very bottom left is Spidey in the sewer. That's a Spider-Man 45 cover. So I said it's a Spider-Man 100, but believe it or not, there's eight different great, famous Ramita Spider-Man covers. And it's actually on 12, it's actually on 12 11 by 17 boards taped from the back. So each cover is its own individual cover, and yet it combines to make this big six foot by three foot piece of artwork. Or six and a half foot by three foot piece of art, you know. How do you store that? Well, believe it or not, it's flattened as uh, it folds. It folds, believe it or not, into one stack. Oh, okay. I would never have guessed that. You know, not, yeah. not with that many pages taped together. The way it's done right, it, it folds and then it folds. It folds into quarters, straight down, and then back. But it's all art. Everything is hand color, hand hand. Uh, but it, it's he's a real good guy named Jimbo Salgado. He's a friend of mine. I met him. He's in the Philippines, and he does like marble he works for like upper deck dust cars but he does marble he said he's doing a lot of valiant covers now so uh, hmm. so he's a professional and a good guy and uh he does these for me and uh and he's doing a lot of famous marble covers for me like recreations of famous old covers that i always have him like i like hand coloring the logos i just think it makes them stick out a little bit more sure with the scenes behind it but i just thought that was just a cool thing uh to do as a commission and maybe i'll frame it up and put it on a wall somewhere if I have a big open spot somewhere. It's just a lot of detail and fun to pick things out on there, you know. So that was yeah. that. It's nice. It's really nice. Yeah. So it's yeah. fun sharing good art, you know. It is. It is. So uh you know the the one thing that uh you know I figured would be fun is uh was going through all this artwork that we really didn't get a chance to look at when we were talking the first time when we were doing the origin story so you, you, right, you, right. you shared a lot of pieces that a couple of pieces i haven't even seen yeah so i appreciate that a lot hey, um it's all about it's nice sharing it as you know on the calf galleries i'm starting to add a piece every day or two two of the original collection i'm starting at 55 and going up to eventually put everything in the calf galleries for everybody to see also so Right. Well, when I started doing these, uh, the calf updates, it was like you were getting in there every week. One, yeah. you, know, you were putting your own piece. And I was like, there's oh, Mike again. You have been showing? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't oh, think. Yes, I didn't know. I think maybe the last couple of weeks, they, they, I didn't put any pieces in. I don't know if maybe you missed a week or here or there. But in the first, like, three or four or five that I did, it was like oh, there was nice. always one piece of yours in there. Because I think you were putting in one piece a week or something. Yeah, I've, I've been trying to put one piece every other day. Oh, well. There you go. Well, it's working. People are looking at yeah, it. Yeah, good, good, good. I'll have to check out that piece by Anchor, though. I had no idea that it that he. Yeah, the Spidey Five Hundred Splash. It's, it's a neat piece. I will. I'll look at it. I'll have to check that one out. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, as far as I think I've gone through every image of stuff that I of photos that I took from your place. I don't think there was anything that I missed because I was trying to. I took a bunch. I took a bunch, but maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't miss anything. So, so oh, you know, one thing I did actually upload one little, just for scale, just that front room. Oh, video. Yeah, it's just it's just a short clip, but uh, you know. Oh, and the stuff up above. Oh, you didn't get to see the stuff up above the TV. It's too bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's things, true. That's beautiful right. canvas paintings too, and that big piece above the above the. The very first one I wanted to share with you, the very first one that shows that picture of Spidey sort of above the front door, I think it was the uh, very first piece you showed that showed the uh, Santa Clauses and stuff like that. Yeah, that one. You know, I know that you see that on the far upper left. That's a big, huge piece. It's like four separate pieces. It's a funny story. I can't think of the artist's name. He's like a, he's a professional artist, but... Uh, it's so funny. He contacted, you know, that's like uh, Mark Bagley. I think like that's the cover, like Ultimate Spider-Man number one or something. But out of the blue, those are done on big, like, you know, those are like like five and a half, six foot pieces of foam cord. There's four of them, you know. And uh, they, that's that retro stuff. I know they do that like in New York City. Guy calls me out of the blue. He goes, Mike, I'm an artist. I'm a professional artist in New York. He goes, I have to ask you, somebody commissioned me to do this, and they never paid me, and I don't know how to get a hold of them. 
I checked online and you're a Spider-Man guy. Would you want to buy these from me? <laughs> I go, <laughs> if you add, and you see he adds to Spider-Man's best friend, to, to Mike Berkey, Spider-Man's best friend, and he signed it in the bottom right. I said, you add that and I'll buy them from you. And this was even before I bought this house. I go, I'm never going to display these things. They're too big. And I bought the house and I said, oh, my God, these fit perfectly above the front door. So that's what I did. So well, it's definitely I, the perfect spot for him. It is, right? Because you don't notice when you come in, but you notice it when you leave, you know? Yeah. So I yeah. thought that was pretty, I thought that was pretty pretty funny. So no, I the uh, that was you know it was always a surprise when you bought the house because uh, I remember it was you know owned by a couple of hippies beforehand. Yeah. So so when we were moving stuff in there, it was everything was paisley and uh, you know very odd oddly awesome. colored, and I'm like. Right, and I'm like, what in the hell? You know, what are you going to do with a place like this? And uh, you know, you've turned it into a nice, painted very nice house. Painted the ceilings and everything. These people even painted the driveway weird colors. They painted the driveway in different swirls and abstract designs. I had to rip out the, the driveway and put a new driveway in. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was uh, cool. Uh, they were definitely probably the the least popular people in the development. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I heard the stories afterwards when after I bought the house. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Mike. Listen, I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me tonight. Sure. Because, yeah, I, I, you know, it was sort sort of short notice because I had had somebody back out, and I was like, "This is the opportunity to talk with Mike that we've been waiting for." Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. I had a lot of fun. I uh, I did too. So you know, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. And if anybody has any questions about Comic Art Live, now that we've got just over two weeks to uh, set things up, just contact me through the, the website. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I think there's already uh, a couple hundred pieces that people have added in the last 24 hours since we turned it on. So uh, I'm very hopeful you know, that we'll have another good turnout as far as uh, the artwork that people are putting in there. I'm sure Mike will put a few pieces in, right? Yeah, but I'm going to put some goodies in before I put it on my website so it gets first look there. That's what I want to hear. Yeah, that was the whole, yeah, that's the whole idea. What I've been telling everybody, you know, behind the scenes and uh, hey, Nick. oh, who's ah Nick? Nick. Hey, hey Nick. One of these days, Nick, you're going to be on the show with with uh, Mike and I. I, 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 I'm my fingers are crossed. Even if I have to buy you know a nice webcam and a good internet connection, we're going to take <laughs> care of this. Um, but uh, but like I, you know, I, you know, my mantra on the show is like bring new art or, you know, art price to sell. I think that that's kind of the key to making the show successful for everybody. Right. I mean, the, yeah. the attendees are going to find stuff that they're, they're going to want to buy. The sellers are going to sell and uh, we, you know, everybody can do it on their own time at their own sites and everything. But uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, I just think it's more fun when we're doing it all together like this and it, and it is going to make it a lot more interesting. We've, we're adding a couple new features into it this time where, people can actually, you know, like we have the like button on calf. Well, we're, we've made it when, when I did the IX art show that launched last week, one of the features we added in there was, was essentially a like button. So you're basically bookmarking things. So rather than having to keep notes and try to figure out who had what piece, you can literally spend your first hour just liking things and oh, putting and them in back to it. And then going back to that as a list. So you, and in that list, it'll tell you if it's sold or not. So, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be a nice way to see, uh, what you might want to buy later, or just you know maybe at the end of the show it didn't sell. You'll you'll be able to go back and contact the seller later. Um, so we're trying to extend the the use you know or the features that are on the site to make it easier for the attendees. But that's also good for the buyer or the sellers too because now you know that your buyers can be bookmarking your art, and we're going to show those stats to the sellers. How many people are viewing the art? That's one thing we didn't do last time either was knowing that your artwork's getting looked at to buy. Uh, but also how many people are adding it to their watch list to remember it. And um, let's see what else. Uh, I don't know. At any rate, it's going to, it's going to be, a, it's going to be an upgrade. It's not going to be the upgrade I wanted, but it's going to be, uh, it's definitely going to make the show a lot easier to, to navigate. Cause I had a hard time. I remember having to open up like 20 tabs that, you know, of things that I wanted to go back and look at. And so now we, you don't have to do that. So that, that to me is like, nice. you know, one of the best upgrades that we're going to get out of the whole thing. So yeah, and and as uh, as Mike knows, I'm a big fan of Camolo as well. And um, one of the things when I was doing Comic Art Live, and I kind of regretted that I didn't do it on the first one, was 
I, I've always, you know, having grown up in the seventies and everything and, and, and Scott Dunbeer's uh, his, his little artworks uh, for his, uh, for his, his thing that he had people draw were, were really cool. And so I've kind of grew up in that idea, just like those spot ads that you'd see in comics. Right. Uh, I always like, like even Albert Moy's, uh, his sketch, you know, his little, I can't even think of who, who, who the artist is, but you know what I mean? When people do artwork specific for a particular show or a logo. So I, I had Camolo do a piece for Comic Art Live for the second one. And I think like every show, I'm going to just have somebody do a different piece of art for it. But I'll just pull it up because I, I liked it. I, I told him, you know, give me something with a, a bit of Kirby in it because Camolo oh, is really, you know, he's, He's clearly done a lot of different, uh, you know, recreations and whatnot. He, he draws a great Galactus, and uh, so I said, "Just give me, give me, give me something fun." And so he put this together for that me. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I think every show I'm going to do something different, you know, just to kind of, and I don't even know how I'm going to use it, but I'm like, you know what? I, it's something that I'm going to remember the show by, <laughs> you know, all the work that I put into making yeah, them. It's an original for you, you know. Exactly, and it was funny. He actually did two. Every time I do, I, I've commissioned him to do something. He's always done, he does like two. I don't know why, you know, uh, just because he doesn't like it. So he did one where he was like, I don't think this, if you ever it's print it. a prelim and a finished? It's actually. No, I, I could literally, well, I won't, I won't pull up the other one. I mean, it's, it almost looks identical, but that one's the one I like better because the details were a little more crisp uh -huh. and everything. Uh, but the other one was more painterly and more, uh -huh. more tonal. And he's like, he looked at it and he's like, well, if you ever wanted to like print it, it might not look as good. So I'll do a second one, you know? And it's and I had him do something for that book, uh, Infected by Art thing project that I do. I, I had him do something in, like six years ago for that, and the same thing happened. He he did one, and and it was to me it was fantastic, but he didn't like it, so he made a second one, and then I got them both. So wow. he's a really great guy. He actually just started a, a, a calf gallery as well. Finally, yeah, I commissioned him to do something for me. Yeah, no. So people should look up uh, Giorgio Camolo. Uh, he's a premium calf member now. If you're ever looking for commissions, he's He's always very busy, but he is one of the most accommodating people that I've ever met. And he's really, really quick. I mean, if, you know, if, if you tell him you expect it done in 30, 60 days, you can pretty much guarantee that he's going to get it done. And he's going to knock it out of the park as far as, you know, what you want. Yeah, he, he's fantastic. So, again, uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate it. And uh, we are off next Tuesday. I guess uh, that that's election night. We, so we would probably not have done the show anyway. The one lesson we have learned is that doing a show during uh, any of the debates or anything like that isn't good for a live performance. Nobody tunes in live and they all watch it afterwards. So it's a good, it's a good thing we're not uh, doing it uh, um, next Tuesday. But the following Tuesday for com the, will be our next Comic Art Live show with Will and Glenn. And uh, we have collective Robert Fry on that one. Thank you, Rich, for the suggestion yeah. on that. We, we reached out to him, and he was uh, really interested in doing it. Um, after that, I know we've got a couple different people lined up. Um, I know Jim Warden has agreed to do uh, an interview with, with us in December. And like you had said, Michael Lovitz has agreed to do yeah. one with us, too. We just have to work out a time with him. So, uh, so we've got lots of fun chats coming up with a lot of important collectors in the hobby. So... A lot of things to look forward to as we approach the holiday season. So, again, thanks a lot, and uh, we will uh, we won't see you next Tuesday, but I'm sure I will see you again next Thursday with uh, my next Comic Art Live chat. Thank you. Sounds good.